Hello everyone. My name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. The series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. For today's webinar, we're very pleased to be hosting Dr. Raphael van der Stichel. He is a quantitative epidemiologist specializing in spatial data analysis with an emphasis on the utilization of open source software. Having worked as a rural veterinarian in England for a few years, he returned to his native Canada to obtain a graduate degree and pursue a career in quantitative epidemiology. He now works as a research scientist in veterinary epidemiology at the Atlantic Veterinary College. Applying his expertise in veterinary medicine and spatial epidemiology, Dr. Van der Stichel has developed an extensive network of collaborations in the fields of aquatic epidemiology, wildlife health research, and disease surveillance. Dr. Van der Stichel participates in the supervision and teaching of graduate students and has taught workshops on spatial epidemiology in North America, Asia, and Latin America. After the presentation, we will be opening the floor for a question and answer session. You'll have the option of asking questions directly using your microphone, or you can type them in and we'll read them aloud. I will now turn the webinar over to Dr. Van der Stichel. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, hopefully everything is working fine. I'm told that if something doesn't work, Darla will step in and, and uh, let me know that, that there's, a, there's an issue. But um, So essentially at, at this stage, um, I was asked to do sort of an introduction to QGIS, which is obviously free and open source GIS system. Um, and as Darla's introduction uh, stated, I'm a veterinary uh, uh, with an interest in, in uh, epidemiology, obviously, but quantify, uh, quantitative side of epidemiology. So GIS is quite an important component of that. Um, I'm also told that I can do a shameless plug at the very beginning of the webinar, so just to introduce our group to all the participants. Uh, very briefly, I'm a research scientist here with the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Aquatic Epidemiology, so the CERC group over at the University of Prince Edward Island. It's a $10 million program funded by NSERC, uh, it's going to last seven years. We're about three quarters through it now. It's led by Dr. Ian Gardner, um, who joined us from UC Davis uh, at the beginning of the program. His uh, specialty expertise is in uh, veterinary epidemiology, particularly in diagnostic test validation. Uh, we've got programs mostly in Canada, so covering both the East Coast and the West Coast, but we also have an international presence in over uh, seven other countries. Um, a lot of the work we do obviously is looking at diseases in aquatic um, species. So a fair bit of that is in the aquaculture world, but not necessarily exclusive to the aquaculture world. Uh, my personal background before joining the aquatic team here was really in the terrestrial species. And that's where I really started having an interest in GIS, um, in the quantitative side of spatial epidemiology. So some of the expertise or experience I've had in the past has been looking at uh, parasite monitoring of dairy cows, looking at wildlife disease surveillance, free roaming dogs in Chile and Bhutan. So you can see there's a there's a wide variety of species that 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 I've worked with that we work with here as a team. Um, but really, what ties it all together is the use of these quantitative tools. Um, the last two years, I've been in the aquatic species, particularly looking at the disease transmission patterns. Uh, looking at the between aquaculture sites, uh, transmission patterns, and also between wild and farm fish. So I think most of the participants in the webinar today are in the aquatic side, um, and so they can appreciate that GIS is can be applied both terrestrial but also in, in on the aquatic species side. So what I thought I'd do is just go over some really quick examples um, and, and then from there start getting into a little bit more of, of the meat um, behind uh, data sets, what they look like, how do you load them, all those things. But I think it's important to give you a bit of a general background first about what we can do uh, in the more advanced uh, type of analysis. So here's an example where during my PhD years I looked at um, the parasite load in dairy cattle, particularly looking at uh, the immune response of cattle against certain parasites and the effect on milk production. 
And so you can see here on the top left a nice schematic of, of a parasite. Most of you probably are not interested in uh, intestinal parasites of dairy cattle. But the point I'm trying to get across is this really was about uh, using predictive models or, or statistical models to understand the relationship between parasites and milk production and also um, looking at risk factors associated with these uh, parasites. And so this is where GIS kind of steps in. Um, we were able to, as you can see the images below, look at vegetation indices, so large data sets, at the same time as we also collected lots of data on, um, on the immune response of cattle to parasites. And we were able to extract a lot of these data. Um, so using GIS we extracted data and those predictors, so in this case vegetation index, temperature and elevation became risk factors in the traditional statistical model. So it wasn't really spatial analysis per se, but it was using GIS and spatial techniques to extract data which then worked its way into the more classic risk factor type studies we do in epidemiology. So that was kind of my first introduction to GIS, the use of those tools. And then my second example, and then, I'll, then we'll move on. Um, but the second example is more of a recent um, study looking at aquatic species, so that might be a bit more of interest for the participants in Chile. So if you're looking at the Chile map, um, in this particular area in the south is where it's cold, obviously, and in this area here is where there's quite a lot of aquaculture. Um, it's broken down into two regions, regions 10 and 11, and all the green dots you can see are all farm sites. And what we're able to do with with this information was to look at a certain disease. I'll just go back one slide. So we were interested in infectious salmon anemia. Some of you may have heard of this virus. There's a pathogenic and non-pathogenic form. And while um, there's non-pathogenic form in circulation, there's always a risk that it may become pathogenic. So there is an interest uh, in surveillance programs to investigate what happens with this virus, how does it circulate even when we don't see any disease associated with it? So part of the surveillance program is to do lots of sampling over uh, repeated um, over several years is where we stepped in. So we had a few years of data, 2011, 2012. And so these are the kinds of things we can do with this information from a spatial point of view. So this is a little bit more spatial analysis. Um, you can see we've got farms and now we have information attached to those farms. So you can see the brown circles are those that have a positive for the non-pathogenic ISA. And then the green ones are those that are susceptible to the virus, um, but they did not have, uh, they were not positive. And then we have white farm and those are species that are not susceptible. So for example, the trout uh, species. So we're looking really at the Atlantic salmon species. So what can we do from just this, these points? So there's a point pattern, if you will. We're able to look at the color. Um, so if you look at this particular image, the color in the background is what we're mostly interested in. And those are estimated prevalences. And we're able to use uh, or determine those estimates based on the point pattern and whether they were positive or negative. And so this is the kind of maps we can generate just from points is now we can have a smooth surface is what this is called and you can see here is around 20 percent prevalence it goes all the way up to 90 percent prevalence so it's a nice summary of what is happening um, with with the farm uh, throughout the whole study period it's over two years the next step we can look at is to look over time so not just to see um, over the whole study period, there's a high risk area, but now we can actually identify time periods in those two years where there was a higher risk of having ISA. And so this is what this um, analysis is able to show. So now we are able to, sh to say that between May 2011 and January 2012, in this particular area, there was higher um, risk to ISA than the rest of the area. Similarly, there was another area starting at the same time, so May 2011 again, to July 2011, so it's, it's a shorter time period. Here it started and it lasted for almost a year and a half. Um, well, not quite a year and a half, but yeah, three quarters of a year. And then up here it started the following year, May, and it continued to July. So then you now you get an idea that it's not just stagnant in time, is that it's progressing. And so it would have started off here at the same time, both these areas, then it, uh, persisted in this area for a few more months, 
then it cleared the infection and then it picked up again following May and it lasted till July 2012. So that, that is the kind of information that we're able to extract from um, the space and also the status of disease and time. So it's a space-time cluster detection. So going back to uh, fisheries, I found this really nice article, it's a few years back now, and it really did a survey about the use of GIS in the fisheries sector. Um, and I think this is quite pertinent to the people watching today the webinar. Um, the title of this uh, article was The Use of GIS by Fisheries Management Agencies. And from their survey, this is three years back, so things may have, may have progressed, hopefully they would have progressed since then. Um, some of the main conclusions that these researchers found was there were barriers preventing more widespread use by managers within agencies, included uh, lack of knowledge or training and limited time to use GIS in job duties. Well, hopefully this webinar will uh, bridge some of those gaps, if you will, uh, show you, give you some knowledge where you can get started with some data sets, putting it into GIS software that's free and, uh, and get you playing uh, with, with those types of data and getting used to it. Um, but also you need time and that's something that obviously I can't give you but I can, I can certainly say it will require time. Um, I've invested a fair bit of time into this from a personal interest, but also because it is required for a lot of the questions that are asked. So you have to put some time in it initially, and then it gets easier and easier. So I'm sure you all know this, but there's no, there's no magic pill, if you will. So hopefully with today's seminar, you'll see later on we'll get, we'll get you through, we'll import some data, we'll get some data downloaded, We'll get some maps up and we'll print, and that really should get you started at this stage into just getting data in, showing it, and having a product. After that, you will need a lot more time if you want to continue in this. The other conclusion, so just following along um, this paragraph, so GIS use within the agency might be increased by focusing on increased biologist participation in training exercises, um, integration with existing job duties, and recognizing the diversity among GIS software. And this last point is, is kind of an important one, and I think most, most people who have heard of GIS probably would have heard of uh, ArcGIS, or an Esri product, which is a commercially available GIS system. I think it's been very common. It was kind of the de facto software for many years. Um, it's very expensive. And um, from a research point of view, that, that's, that is potentially a very big barrier. Uh, we've got projects, I've got colleagues who have projects, for example, in Africa, and when they're doing um, the budgets for research, sometimes the GIS software, if it was commercial, would make up the bulk of the funding um, for the project. And so instead of going out and sampling animals and and, uh, and being able to, to get local resources, you have to put money aside to pay for expensive software. So, um, so that really was one of the big motivation, particularly in the EPI field. We're quite fortunate. There's a large group of us, a lot of colleagues who are, who've really jumped onto this open source software. This is my last slide in the intro, then we'll get into a little bit more of the GIS component things, but I wanted to give you a bit of an idea of, of spatial analysis and, and the structure behind it. Um, when I first started off, you know, you, you get a lot of, um, you, there's a lot of things you want to do with your data. You, you want to see it, you want to explore, you, you want to do models, you want to do all kinds of interesting things, but it's not always well organized, um, at least in your way of thinking. So this structure, or this proposed structure by Bailey and Gattrell in the late 90s, is, forms a really good framework, if you will, on how to think about spatial analysis. So we start off here where we're at the visualizing stage. And this is today what I really want you guys to get a handle on is being able to visualize data. So we want to map out cases. And a lot of this work is organizing data. I'm sure if some of you have done data analysis, you know that the bulk of the time in analysis really is just organizing data, data manipulation, cleaning variables, going through data sets, make sure they make sense, any outliers, so on and so forth. So this is why I think today is the is important and it'll be the building step if you are interested in going further and doing more analysis. Um, today we'll be using QGIS, so this is the icon for QGIS. Within QGIS there's also other software that we're not going to use today, but they are very much part of the framework um, and they're easy to um, to have plugins or, or easy access within QGIS. That's why there's a bit of a 
a triangle, if you will, um, and that's GRASS and R. And those two are command-based software. They're pretty intimidating, I'll be honest, for, for people starting off in analysis, but they really are the engines behind the hardcore spatial analysis. So again, today we're going to do the visualizing QGIS, but keep in mind that you've got other software built into QGIS that have real strong engines to do computational tasks, and those will help you in the exploration. So when I talk about exploration, I'm talking about smoothing techniques. If we go back a few slides, you, you'll, you'll remember I showed um, a nice color map of ISA uh, prevalence. So it, it's a way of converting points into a surface of, of, of different intensity, if you will. So those would be classified as the exploration tools. Then there's the, the, the next step, which is modeling. And that requires um, different sets of software, mostly R, Geoda is another example. If you've got polygons or SAT scan on point data, I actually use the cluster detection. Um, so with the fish example I gave earlier, I use SAT scan uh, as a software to detect those clusters. Um, but there's always a formal hypothesis testing involved with modeling. Um, so as all statistical models, there are assumptions um, and you're going to be generating um, probability values or p-values. So this really falls under the statistics side of things and it's quite a lot more advanced. Um, but you can see, so you start off at the visualize, then you move on and you explore, you're looking for patterns but not really having formal hypothesis-driven questions. Then if you actually want to infer from your data, look at find risk factors, detect areas of high risk or cluster detection, then you're going to use more formal um, more formal models. Okay, that was quite quick. Uh, how am I doing for time? Yeah, I think we're, we're doing fine. So, um, so that was quite a quick introduction, but really what I want to go over is the structured approach to spatial analysis and how today we're going to show you some of the first steps. Before we actually get into the GIS software, which you'll notice is way at the bottom, and we will spend a fair bit of time on the software itself, but before we get there, there is a lot of information that you need to, to have. And thinking back, when I first started, I did look a lot at uh, YouTube videos, so on and so forth. They were very helpful at the how-to within the QGIS. But what was missing in a lot of these YouTube videos is all the background information that I'm going to hopefully share with you today. Albeit it'll be quite quick and compact, but I think it's important for those who have never um, handled spatial data to have an idea of what the types of data they are, how is it stored, and that there's coordinate reference systems. So each one of these really should take a lot more than, than a few minutes um, to go into the depths of it, but for today I just want you to be aware of um, some of the components within GIS, how to acquire data, so I'm going to show you some websites where there's a lot of great free data, um, and then we'll get into the QGIS. So that's the plan uh, for, for, for the hour. All right, so for GIS, it is essentially a way of representing the real world. So if you've got the real world sort of at the bottom, uh, schematic at the bottom here, then you want to be con you're going to convert some of the characteristics of the real world into data. And these can be broken into rasters and vectors, and we'll get into that in the next few slides. But essentially, it's a representation of the real world. You will never get it right. It won't be perfect but it's a way of trying to capture information that's happening in the real world in a certain place or location and also in a certain time period. So those two are really important, it's space and time. And with all this sort of uh, derivatives, if you will, or, or, or ways of interpreting the real world, so there's points and lines and polygons and all of these will make their way into data sets that are stored and managed on computers. So you're going to see those today. There are lots of tools in place to convert real-world data into this digital world, and so GPS units, satellite images, uh, range finders, so on and so forth. So there's lots of tools to digitize, and that really is um, what spatial data is. It's a digitized version, a representation of what the real world is. So now getting into more specifics, 
Well, there are different types of data, and I think the next few slides, yeah, I'll go into more details, but we've got points, which I think most people, that's pretty intuitive, as I showed with the farms, you've got farms in the, in the water, so they represent a certain location, so a point. You can have roads, uh, streams of rivers, so on and so forth, those can be represented as lines. You've got areas, so provinces, regions, those are called polygons in the in the GIS world and then you've got grids and those are images or data um, and they're all represented in a grid format. Think of this as a picture. When you take a picture you've got essentially pixels and each one of those pixels represents color data. Well you can transform this into uh, um, elevation, for example, where each pixel wouldn't necessarily tell you the color, but it would tell you the elevation. So those types of data are called rasters and also grids, and they usually contain continuous data. So one thing not to forget is every time you load one of those beautiful looking maps, a vector maps, or sometimes they're called shape files that, that I'll be referring to them later and explaining them in more details, there's always spatial data that's contained within those files. They're oftentimes hidden in the sense that when you load up a vector map, you load up points or you load up polygons from shape files, you don't actually see the tables behind that have the X and the Y coordinates. They're hidden, but they're handled within the software. So for example, a ArcGIS, a QGIS, you just load a shapefile and boom, you've got a beautiful map of, for example, Prince Edward Island. That's where I'm from. So beautiful map of the island. Great. But and 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 also I'll show you this today. When you open the table, you may have attributes. So those are uh, names of counties or all kinds of information attached to it. But even below that, there is um, a data set that stores every bit of line, every point that is associated with that object. So for example, if you've got in the real world, you've got an area A, an area B, or a point B, and a line C, what you're actually going to have is an object A. There's going to be a table that you won't see, but it exists in the background. And in this table, it's going to be attached to A, and you're going to have all of these X and Y coordinates associated with this object A. It's going to recognize that it's a polygon because the first point is also going to be the last point. So you don't need to know the specifics. You just need to know that there are different classes of data, and the major types are points, lines, and polygons in the vector world. And so they're all stored um, in the background. That's kind of the take-home message. Um, at this stage. So what I described so far is a lot of the spatial type data, but what's also what you need to keep in mind is data associated with process in the world, if you will, um, or in epidemiology context we're looking at cases, there's animals, there are farms. Um, in with areas, you've got provinces, regions, and those have information associated with them. And the point of this slide is at the bottom you'll notice that I also have a category called continuous data. And this is because in continuous data you can also sometimes find point data. So what do I mean by this? Okay, let's go back. With points, we're interested in the process. So presence of um, of an animal, a presence of a farm is what we're interested in. It's the fact that it's there that's important. With the area data, it's aggregation of information. So we've got lots of, um, of, of, um, of information that is stored in a categorical type of a data or it's aggregated within this group. And the last one is this continuous data, and if you think of this as um, the vegetation index I showed where everything was green, or if you want to think of it as um, temperature, it's uniformly present throughout your whole study area. And so the best way of representing continuous data is if you've got this raster or grid as I showed you before. Essentially it's an image. Um, so it can either be an image with, with color, or it can be data. Elevation is a good example. But as part of the same process, 
So while it's still a continuous process, you can also have points that collect bits of information at those locations. So in this case, you might think of it as a weather station. And so the weather station, yes, it is a point, but it's really modeling or really trying to pick up, not modeling, but picking up a continuous data type of information. So temperature, precipitation. Same thing with elevation bathymetry. For example, if you have a soil and you're trying to map out what the soil looks like in a field, well, you're going to go out and you're going to collect soil at certain spots, and those spots will have a point, but you don't really care where the point is per se. It's not the fact that there's a point that matters, it's what the soil sample um, says at that point. And in those situations, what you want is a nice uniform distribution of points. So that's really important because you're going to notice that we're going to have, oh, let me minimize this, we're going to have points that come up as cases, and we'll have examples of those. We're going to have also areas, polygons, so on and so forth. And then we're also going to have um, rasters or elevation, all those sorts of things. And sometimes they come in points. But this point is not the same as those points. Okay, I hope I'm making sense. Typically, people can interrupt me any time to ask questions, but obviously in the webinar, it's a little difficult. So I'm going to move on, save those questions if I didn't make something very clear. Okay, so again, I'm simplifying things here a little bit, um, where typically we've got points, lines, and polygons, and they're all stored. We would call them vector types. And yeah, this is kind of the common examples. Typically, sh vectors will be stored as shapefiles. There are many other types of files out there, but the ones that are typically used would be shapefiles. If you've got simple point data, then sometimes um, you can store, well, oftentimes you would store those in Excel or in a comma-separated value format, CSV. And I would think this is quite common. Most of you probably listening in would have data of your own that has points where you've got a collection of some kind, an X and a Y coordinate with some information attached to it. Most of the time, this is what we're interested in. Um, then there's also the grids and those, so the rasters, and those tend to be stored as TIFFs, same as a picture, it's like a TIFF picture or a JPEG, any of those. Um, excuse me, so those, we would call those GeoTIFF, where essentially it is a TIFF, you've got uh, an image, but the geo component stores extra information that's held within the container for TIFFs. So those are the common ones. Also, I'm not even touching databases. There's a whole day and a half of workshops we could go on on databases. It's a very good way of storing all of these data. You can share them online with different groups, so on and so forth. So it's very powerful. But at this point, we're going to just stick to very simple uh, self-contained files that you can download, you can save on your hard drive. And those typically are shape files uh, and TIFFs and then also data, data sets in Excel or in CSV files. Okay, um, right. I need to talk about coordinate reference systems. Again, this can be, uh, this can in itself is a whole course. So I'm going to be rather superficial on this, but I want you to understand um, that there are differences in, in coordinate reference systems. This was very important in the earlier versions of QGIS where they didn't have a lot of um, on-the-fly conversions, as they call it, where you can put in different maps from or different vectors with different projections in QGIS, and in the past, it wouldn't convert them. So if you were using one system with a certain unit, it would be on the exact same canvas as another system, but you can imagine those X and Y coordinates wouldn't necessarily match up. So if you're in lat long, for example, so then you're in the minus 80 to plus 180, those, so the whole world would fit in just 360 uh, units. Compare that to if, if you've got universal transverse mercator where you're into meters, so now when you're talking large areas, you're in the thousands if not millions um, of units. So they just wouldn't match up. So we do need to talk about them, they're important, but 
now as I just loaded the new the latest version of QGIS, I realized they actually made improvements on on the fly, so it's becoming less and less of an issue where QGIS is very similar to ArcGIS if you're used to GIS systems. If you're completely new to GIS systems, then listen in and then we'll get through this and hopefully it'll make sense of it. Okay, so coordinate reference systems are really important. They have to be consistent between your map layers. It's what defines your X and your Y coordinates. Otherwise, they're just numbers. They don't mean anything. Okay, so they're expressed into two types of families. One is the geographical reference system, and the other one is a map projection. So the geographical reference system is really the shape of the world. So that would be your latitude, longitude. And there are lots of, let me just switch over to the next slide and I'll, I'll go back. So there are lots of ways you can try to model what the Earth looks like. You can think of it as a perfect sphere. And if that's the case, then the latitude and longitude, which is based from the center of the, of the Earth, will have a slightly different, uh, will hit Earth at a slightly different location, depending on what shape you're assuming the Earth has. So that's what all of these systems really mean. If it's spheroid, if it's ellipsoid, um, a geoid is based on gravity. There's all kinds of ways of trying to figure out or map what the world looks like, theoretically, if you will. The most common system that, that, uh, that we're going to be dealing with is the WGS84. So keep this in, in your, <laughs> fresh in your mind because we'll be using it a lot. It's an important one. Um, and it stands for the World Geodetic System of 1984. Another one that was quite common before, and it was the, the default um, uh, geographical reference system for GPS units, was this North American Datum of 83. Since we're doing, we're collaborating a lot with international people, we tend to stick to the world standard. So I think this NAD83 is kind of phasing out a little bit, although when you're getting a GPS unit, make sure that if you're going to be taking your X and your Y coordinates or your lat longs, make sure you go into the systems and figure out if you're WGS84 or NAD83. The take home message is when you can set it, set it to WGS84. It's the default and it's, it's, it's a simple one to use. This is just lat long, so we're not actually projecting anything yet. So what do I mean by this? Um, well, when we're projecting it, we're going from the three-dimensional world where you've got this lat long and, and you've got the world in 3D. And just like an orange, I'm sure we've all done this, you, take, you peel away the orange, but to make it flat on the counter, as this is an example of uh, Mandarin a few Christmases ago, um, where I broke it up and I flattened it out on the on the on the counter, you have to break it up into all kinds of little areas for it to flatten out nicely. That's because when you go from 3D to 2D, you need to have transformations or projections. So you can imagine that the distance from this point to this point, while it's flattened out, appears to be very far. Reality is when this was all composed into the orange, it was just a matter of going one millimeter from the left to the right. So we need to capture this distortion in the projection. And there are lots of different projections and some that are more suitable for the types of analysis we want to do. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of the types of projections and then we'll get back to, let's keep it simple and I'll give you a recommendation going forward, um, which fits most people, but not 100% of the cases. Um, so the common one that we would tend to recommend are the conformal projections, and, and I won't go into too much details, but, but essentially you're, every time that you're converting from 3D to 2D, you're going to somehow distort one of these four characteristics, the shape, the area, the direction, or the distance. And so what we tend to do for spatial analysis, we're really interested in distances and angles. And in that case, universal transverse mercator is, is the projection of, of choice. Um, yeah, you know, I'll just skip ahead, just in interest of time. Um, so for the, mass, for the map projections, we've got standards which help us out. And when you're dealing with a new map, it's very important that you understand which projection it has. Typically, when they're not defined, they're just WGS84, so they're just lat-long following the world geodetic data of 84. That's nice. 
but it's not always the case. When they're projected, then they will have a projection associated with it, and you need to get that right. If you get the wrong projection associated with that file, you will never get it projected in the right area, and it will be a completely meaningless map. There is a group, the European Petroleum Survey Group, I think now they've been renamed into another committee group, but essentially EPSG, you will see this lettering uh, frequently associated with projections. They're the organization committee that set um, the standards for projections, and they have um, in store or a database with over 3,900 projections, each with a unique ID. So instead of having to keep the transformation or the equation associated with how you transform x, x, x y coordinates from one projection to the other, you just need to have this unique ID. It's a, it's a set of a few numbers, and, and that's attached with that, with that projection. So take home message, let's keep this simple. Um, for lat long, we want to use the world geodetic system of 84 and in decimal degrees if possible. If we're needing to do um, analysis or if we need to do measurements in meters, so where distance and angles are important, then we're going to be using the universal transverse mercator. Okay, that was kind of GIS background in a nutshell. Um, let me just check for time. Yeah, so I've got 20 minutes or so. Okay, um, so hurrying along. Oh, um, right, now, now sort of the more practical things. You want to get data. Where do you go? There's a ton of resources online to get mapping data. Um, and I'm also going to really briefly introduce the teaching data set. I think uh, Darla has managed to upload two files to share with you. One is a PDF that walks through a little bit more of the a practical exercise uh, using QGIS. Um, and then the other one is the data set that I'm going to introduce uh, very shortly. And then we'll get into a, a live demo with QGIS. Okay. Uh, so where do I get data? Well, oftentimes I just Google it, to be honest. I just put it in a search engine and I put keywords like shapefile or raster or grid or data, uh, map data, those are kind of the essential keywords to actually get data. Otherwise, you get stuck with atlases, images, all sorts of things. So you are looking after spatial data. And then, of course, whatever keyword is associated with what you're looking for. Is it elevation? Is it population? So on and so forth. Uh, oftentimes through your local government, um, so provincial government, uh, I'm kind of skipping ahead a little bit, but they also provide lots of um, different data, not just maps, but also data. Uh, I get a lot of data from PEI in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia when I'm doing aquaculture as well in New Brunswick. Lots of coastlines, lots of uh, summary data where parks are, so on and so forth. So it's a really good source and it's reliable and they have metadata associated with it. Um, and they're usually free. Uh, all those in academic worlds, uh, you have access to libraries and they also have access to databases. Uh, for example, the postal code um, database for all of Canada is, is available freely for, for research purposes, um, which, is, which is bonus. Um, what's important, and I'm just following my points here so I don't miss anything, it's important that you actually investigate the data source. Make sure that you can trust it. Make sure that it makes sense. Uh, hopefully there's a metadata attached to it and that you know what the, pro what the projection information is. If you don't know what the projection is, you can guess, but you may end up just pulling your hair out because you will not get it to project what you want to um, or make sense of it or have borders that are meaningless, so on and so forth. So that's one of the key things is make sure there is a, uh, information attached to it. My preferred sites, I'll cycle through them pretty quickly um, to show you examples, but the Diva GIS, it's wonderful. It has uh, administration and, and um, roads, uh, uh, rivers, lakes, all kinds of things for every country in the world in lat long form, easily, easy to download, and we'll be using some of those data sets for the examples we have further down. GeoGratis in Canada is wonderful as well. I have a lot of, I've gotten a lot of data from them on uh, and DVI for so um, vegetation indices, for example, I got those from GeoGratis, and again I mentioned the provincial governments. So this website, I would copy it down if I were you. Um, I also have this in the handout because you will be downloading data from Diva GIS. GeoGratis, this is what it looks like uh, in French and in English. 
Uh, one map that I used before is the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. They've got all kinds of information, elevation, bathymetry, um, eco-regions around North America, so this includes Mexico as well, um, which can be useful. And again, local um, government sites, for example, Government of PEI, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, I know for sure because I've accessed those databases. You may have access to other databases as well. Um, and worldwide as well. I didn't include any international databases because I thought most of the participants were Canadian, um, but there are in Europe, for example, NUTS, N-U-T-S or Z, I can't remember, but there's a European Commission where they hold a lot of, uh, a lot of European maps as parts of, uh, of statistics, if you will. So there's a lot of resources out there. Um, really briefly, I've provided you with a, a, a data set Darla has uploaded, as I mentioned. It's, uh, it's on avian influenza in Vietnam and is based on the publication by uh, Dirk Pfeiffer et al. in 2007. And they looked at um, high path avian influenza um, in Vietnam, so in chickens and ducks uh, occurring yeah, throughout Vietnam in 2003 to 2006. And so you have those data where it's provided as, in this case, it's an XLSX. Um, originally, when I uploaded it or gave it to Darla, it was a CSV. Um, CSV stands for comma separated value. So it's almost, it's essentially a text file with commas separating each value. This is the preferred way of handling data and it's the way QGIS likes to import it. So if you do have the Excel, which I'll, I'll show you with a demo, I'll convert it back to a CSV and then we'll, we'll We'll import that into QGIS. Um, through this Diva GIS, we're also going to be able to download shapefiles, um, shapefiles for provinces and districts of Vietnam. So between these two, you should be set to go to follow along the exercise that I provided in the handout and also get you going with some maps. Um, next slide is the dedicated to shapefiles. Most of you may have heard of the word shapefiles. Um, but it's, it's important to spend a minute and explain what it is and what does it look like. Um, if I've got a folder up and running, yes, I do. Hopefully, you can see this at the same time, um, and hopefully it's clear. So if I highlight all of these files together, you can see I've got Vietnam North, uh, Northeast Districts, and I've projected it as a World Geodetic System 84. So this is kind of the code I used for, so I can remember what's in this particular vector. You'll notice that there's a lot of files that I've highlighted. There's a DBF, a PRJ, a QPJ, SHP, and an SHX. And when I refer to a shapefile, what I really mean is the aggregation of all of these files together. They have to be treated as a group. If I just copy this SHP and move it to another folder and try to import it into QGIS, it's not going to work because all of these files work in conjunction. And this is what this slide is going to explain. So the shapefile itself, the star.shp, is the main file that contains the primary geographic reference data. So think of that as the table that has all of the hidden X and Ys that you will never see. That is the shape itself. Then we've got an index format, so shx, and what this does is it indexes the records. So it links the SHP with this DBF. And DBF, some of you may have heard, it's a database file. Um, this is where the actual table is that holds information that we would typically see. So for example, the name of a region, or um, in the case of the avian influenza, we're looking at was there an infection in this year in this commune. So this is all the data that we're going to see when we load up the data in QGIS. So attributes, oops, index, and shape. This is mandatory. Without those three files in the same folder, your data will not load in QGIS. The other one, PRJ, is very important, but it's not mandatory. And this is your projection file. In this projection, in this file, it's nothing more than a text file, and in there we'll have a whole bunch of words that will tell QGIS what the projection is. This one is, I would consider, very important unless you know um, what the projection is from memory or if you, somebody gave it to you and they t tell you what the projection is, okay, you don't need it then, but you will need to assign a projection and then you can generate this file in the future. Um, 
but I would be very cautious if you don't have projection. Then there's all these other optional files. I think I just showed you one. Um, SH, which one is it? QPJ, for example. This one is not necessary at all, but the software that you use to load those shape files will usually generate those automatically. They tend to be software specific indexing. It's to make searching a lot faster and it's to optimize the system. So if you're using ArcGIS or Esri products, then you tend to see SBN or SBX. If you're using QGIS, then you're going to see QPJ and QIX. Those you can delete and when you share from colleagues to colleagues, you don't need them. Okay. Um, so now to the good part, and there's only, oh gosh, only 14 minutes left, so it's a bit of a whirlwind. Most of you hopefully will have at this point, uh, let me maximize, downloaded QGIS. If you haven't, that's okay. You can do it after, obviously, and given the exercise, you can follow along in the data set. You're more than happy to do that on your own time. Um, you will find it on QGIS.org. The latest version now is 2.12, which they call Lyon. I just checked and I think they're due for a new one, uh, 2.13, um, in nine days or so. So QGIS is constantly pumping out new versions, um, which is a good thing and a bad thing. The, the downside to pumping out new versions all the time is you're always behind. Screenshots look different um, and you have to kind of organize some of your plugins. Um, yeah, we'll get into more of that. But as they've progressed, it, they've done the process better and better. So it's actually getting better and better and easier to upgrade than it used to be in the past. I started, uh, my first version was 1.7 in 2011. We gave a workshop. And so all the screenshots were totally different. The plugins system was, was cumbersome. The analysis was nearly impossible. We had to have all kinds of plugins and, and that, that would, you'd have to install in Windows, so on and so forth. All this to say it's getting better and better, which means it's going to be easier for people to use it, um, which is a good thing. So installing QGIS, we used to say, so this is a colleague of mine, Javier Sanchez, we, when we gave workshops in the past, we used to say Ma uh, Windows only. And that was because we had to get plugins to work and we had to put it in certain folders and it was very complicated. Now I've had participants in rec more recent workshops, they've installed Mac. Um, and I told them they were on their own and they've installed it flawlessly, no issues, and they were able to follow along. So while I don't provide support because it's too difficult to tell participants install anything, so I'm still recommending Windows, but I think that um, it's moving forward really well. I've also got a version of it at home on, on a little Linux machine and it works great for mapping. Analysis is a bit different but for mapping it works great. So all this to say you can install it in whichever platform you want and it's getting better and better and more integrated with every version that goes through. Um, before also uh, we had to install Grass and R in different ways, very complicated. Now when you install it you'll notice that there's Grass that gets installed automatically and you're going to have a desktop version with or without grass. And if I were you, if you're just doing visualization of your spatial data, I would just skip grass altogether and just use the default. If you're going to be doing analysis or you have used grass and R in the past, then it's worth um, installing the desktop that has grass and then you can run grass commands um, on, your, on your data. The plugins and packages, again, in the past it was quite complicated where um, you would have to, every time you upgraded, your plugins would, would be gone and they would be broken links, so on. Now what they do is they install them in the user. And so as you upgrade every version, it points back to your user folder. So it makes upgrading very easy. The downside to it is now when I'm going to show you the QGIS, I actually can't install a new QGIS with no plugins anymore unless I delete everything. So, this, so the QGIS you're going to see me show you with buttons and toolbars will have extra plugins that you may not get as default, but I'll show you how to get those defaults or how to get those plugins. Okay, so plugins, yeah, well, I'll show them in the demo, but essentially you go to plugins, manage and install plugins, um, and then typically extra bits you want to do is the open layers plugin is excellent the table manager and the value tool. Value tool lets you look at um, values within rasters. So those are the typical three that I would say you really should install on your own. More and more now they're becoming uh, part of the core installation of QGIS. So they're becoming less plugins and more part of the software as they, as they get integrated. So this kind of changes a lot. But, but, the, but really the bottom line is 
install QGIS. If it doesn't do something you want it to do, Google it. There's probably a plugin that lets you do it. And also it's important if you're going to be doing some of those plugins that are experimental, so they're not fully vetted out yet, is you need to toggle on the experimental plugins. Um, so this slide is to remind me of doing a demonstration. I've only got a few slides left. I've got 10 minutes, so it's taking a little longer than I had hoped to go through the, through the background information, which is why I'm actually happy that we do have the handouts. Um, but I'll get started. Normally I do this with obviously live audience, so I've got one and several screens. So I've got one screen that kind of lists all the things that I want to show you in the demo. Um, I'm going to start with the demo and if I forget something, I'll toggle back and look at my list and see if, if I've hit all the main ones. Um, okay, and then typically I take questions now, but I think because it's a webinar, we'll just, we'll move on. Okay. QGIS. Uh, one of the first things we want to do is orient you to the main software. So I'm going to click it. This is what my QGIS looks like. Your may look, yours may look a little different, especially with these icons here, but that's that's okay. When you launch it, you're going to have the menu bar on top here, um, which is standard for all software. You're going to have the name of your project up here, which is at this point, it's a blank, so I don't have a new project name. What you see here is the layer panel. This is probably one of the most important areas to look at. This is where you manage your vectors when you start loading them up. And then this is obviously your display window. And down here, it's very hidden. It's very small, but you can see all of this information at the bottom. This is your status bar. And we, I use this actually quite a lot because it tells me what the units I'm dealing with tells me the projection. So now you'll notice this EPSG that I talked about. So this is um, uh, the projection that it's currently using. So 4326, um, which stands, actually you can see it just highlighting on the bottom. I'm not going to move my cursor, but you can see WGS84 is, is, the, is the default. And OTFR, on the fly, reference is what OTFR stands for, disabled. That might be way too small to, to see on the, web, on the web, but essentially it tells me that right now I don't have on the fly, so it's just a blank canvas. Okay. One of the first things I'm going to do following my list here is load some shapefiles. That's probably what you guys have been dying to see from the beginning. So load some shapefiles. I've got some shapefiles here. If you follow along the, the handouts, you'll be downloading them. I'll just show you quickly, well, no, you can see them. If you download them from uh, uh, Diva GIS, you're going to be getting these zip folders or these zip files. So I'm going to unzip them really quickly. Um, so I'll unzip them in this directory. So I've got roads, administration, and now my last one's water. Okay, so I've unzipped them. Great. If you go to administration, you're going to see a ton of files. Uh, it's organized so that you've got uh, the zero, which is the country, one, which is region, two, province, three, district, and four, communes. So if I want to load up um, province, then I'm going to put two. So again, I'm aiming for shape. The shape file is all I need at this point to drag and drop into my layer panel. This is a shortcut. So if I drag and drop, boom, it loads it up quite nicely. I could have used these icons. So this is the toolbar here to load shape files. So if I have a vector, this is the icon I use. And then I can browse and I can go to my Vietnam admin. What's nice with this is I can actually select, oh, I just want shape files. And then it's a little bit easier to manage. So now I want the level, uh, let's pick level three, okay. So now you're going to see that I'm going to load the third level, the administration level. Um, yeah, okay. So in here is where I load up a lot of my files. Uh, then I've got my navigation. So how do I move around? Well, I use these icons. So the hand helps you grab. So I'm clicking and, and, and moving around. So that's easy. On my mouse, I use the little scroll bar to scroll in and out. Ooh, that scrolled really fast or I can use these icons, so the zoom button, 
and I just click at the top and I can zoom all the way in. So this may seem basic, but this is kind of how to get you started. Uh, the exercises will go through all of these functions quite nicely, which is nice. Um, I'm going to just change uh, without jumping around too much. Yeah, I'm just going to change the color so that it actually looks a little better because right now it looks pretty awful. So by double clicking on the layer, you can see I've got all these options. Under style is where I'm going to be able to change color and make things look nice, um, which is all available on the handout, which is nice. So now you'll notice I just changed the color um, of this layer, but I don't see any color change yet. And that's because the order of your vectors is very important in your panel. So if I were to drag and move this up, then I would bring it forward. A little bit like PowerPoint when you've got moving objects forward and backward. It's the same idea. But now the order of, of the layers means is what it's what I see from first to second. Um, I can also, if I choose, you'll notice a little X, I can untoggle. So if I untoggle, it's still loaded in the data set, but I just don't see it in the display anymore. So those we tend to use quite a lot. Um, so I'll move it back up again, and then I can double click, as I mentioned. You can get all kinds of information here. For example, you can get the from the from the general tab, you can get where the file is located, you can get the coordinate system, you can change the color, and there's a lot of explanation in this. This is called symbology. So you can put um, symbols, you can change the color, so on and so forth, and you can graduate. You can change whether you want to categorize um, the color scheme or have a graduated color scheme. So I'll let you play with all those on your own at this stage. I do want to keep going and just show you some of the basics of QGIS because this you can play around for hours and hours um, to your heart's content. Um, yes, so for plugins, this is actually quite important. You will need to load in your plugins and to find those on the top here you've got plugins, manage and install plugins and this is where you can um, Oh, see, I've already it's remembered that I had a query up here. So this is where you have access to all the extra plugins. There are a lot. So for the exercise, you will need to use the um, open layer. So if you start, if you go in the search and start typing open layer, you'll find it. I already have mine installed, obviously. But in this case, if it's not installed, then you would have to install it down here. It may actually come as the default, but um, anyway. So install or upgrade as, as you need to. Uh, the other one that I tend to use is value tools. This one here here is excellent and table um, manager is another one too. So I would make sure you have at least those uh, loaded or installed if you don't already. Um, I'm running out of time. I've got only a couple of minutes. Darla, do you want to jump in? Um, and I mean, how strict are we for the one hour? We are um, not. We're not strict at all. You will not be cut off. So if you would like to go a little bit longer, that's perfectly fine. Okay, um, so just another a few minutes because what I want you to be able to do is, is print as well. That's kind of the last thing I want to show you. Um, import a CSV and then print. So we'll do those two tasks and then I'll call it quits and then we'll, uh, we'll pick up some questions from there. So loading data, and I think this is important because most of you will have your own data. Uh, the data set that's provided online has been converted to XLSX. So what you will need to do is convert it to an S, sorry, a CSV. So let's double click Excel and launch that. Hopefully you have Excel. If you don't, then I think OpenOffice will let you open XLSX or perhaps an online converter will let you um, convert it to um, an open source Excel spreadsheet. Um, so here we go. When we open the data, this is what it looks like. Fantastic. These, all these columns are linked wow, there's a lot, are all linked to the name of the communes. Okay, so if you remember, these are commune level data. And then I've got an X and a Y coordinate, and then I have the infection status. So from a data point of view or epi data point of view, I'm only really interested in this. All the bits in blue I highlighted are just um, the code so that I can link this CSV up with um, with the polygons that are uploading from 
uh, GIS, Diva GIS. Don't forget, these data sets are part of like a five-day workshop I usually put on with colleagues here um, teaching about spatial analysis. So I've just taken snippets out of that to give you a little bit of a sense of the visualization aspect of things. Okay, so what we do now is we're really only interested in these columns, so U to AAA, but we need to save the entire data set as a CSV. So to do that, you go to Save As, drop down, and then and your option here should be comma delimited. I, really, I wish they would have called it comma separated value to match the CSV, but they call it comma delimited. That's fine. So click on that. And now I'm going to save this as dataset RV CSV. So save. It's going to come up with all kinds of warnings. Do you want to keep this in the same format? Okay, sure. And then I'm going to close and it's going to say, do you want to save? No, we don't want to save. That's fine. It has saved it because you can see CSV file is here. Um, so now with the CSV file, I cannot just drag and drop, as you remember me doing with my vectors. With CSV files, I have to import them, okay? There's a few ways to do it. I can just click on this little icon on the bottom left, or the more formal way, if you will, is to go through layer, add a layer, go down, add the limited text layer. Great. Now I'm able to browse for the file which C temp, that's good, data set RV CSV. That's the one I just downloaded and converted. Good, open. It's quite a busy field, but that's because there's a lot of things you can do. If you're in Europe or Latin America, instead of commas, they tend to use semicolons. Um, that's because the period is a comma and the comma is a period for thousands. So it gets complicated when you start having international data sets. So that's why all of these options are here so that you can specify. Um, how how it's delimited. You can custom de design your delimiters, so on and so forth. So the take home is load your data. You're going to give it a name for the layer that's going to show up on this window here. It is a CSV. Great. I'm going to actually want to use the X and the Y coordinate from my file. So I'm going to use point coordinates. If I had no points but I just wanted to link up a table um, to join a table on maybe one of these IDs that I also had an ID for a polygon and I have a separate table but I've matched them on one common unique ID then I can just bring it in no geometry it will just bring it in as a table in this case I actually want to bring in my X and my Y coordinates it's kind of clever because it kind of goes to the default. It knows that for an X field it's looking for X something, but here I could have picked any variable that would have suited properly for the X. In this case it is correct, it is the X coordinate. For the Y, same thing, you have to tell it where to get the Y coordinate. And now I'm good to go. So, ta-da, all the points show up. It's very rewarding to see a data you've created come to life um, in, the, in the GIS software. So, uh, let me just make it a little easier to see. Okay, so that looks really nice. The key thing I want you to know is this is still just a CSV table. This is not a shapefile. And part of the exercise goes through and cho shows you how to convert this to a shapefile, which is save as. And then here when you save as, the option is a shapefile. Wonderful. I also have the option of saving instead of a shapefile, I can take shapefiles and I can get them out as regular tables, which is also very nice. So for example, as a save as um, here, this is a polygon. So now if I want to have a data set, I can just save as, se select comma separated value. And what it's going to do is give me the attribute table. So what does this attribute table look like? I actually I didn't cover that yet. Um, so if I right click and scroll down to open attribute table, this is what this data set looks like. So you can see um, each one of these are provinces. Yes, they're provinces. So this is all the information I have associated with the provinces. What's also very practical is if I highlight provinces here on, this, um, on the table, I should be able to see if I was zoomed properly. So now to zoom to the layer, I just click zoom to layer, ta-da, great. So now I can see the whole country and the provinces I've highlighted are these provinces that you see um, in the map, which is really practical. Um, so for example, if I wanted to just select the northerly provinces and figure out which ones are those, I can highlight using the selector 
key I'm on, and I'm on this layer, so it's going to highlight all the objects on this layer, and I'm also dealing with the table, now it tells me which ones are in the table. So it's very practical, it links between your attribute and what you see. Um, again, I'm straying a little bit away from where I wanted to go. I think the last point I was trying to make was print. Um, so you've got a, say you've got a beautiful image, let's just zoom in, this looks just beautiful. Um, now I want to print this. Okay, so I go to project and I go to print composer, oh, new print composer, sorry, I don't have one existing in the project yet. So new print composer, what am I going to call it? Oh, let me just call it figure one. And then this window pops up. And this window is where you can think of this as um, a page, if you will, a sheet, a blank canvas where you're going to put your image on. The first step is to add a new map. There's an icon here. And again, this is all in the work in the handout. So if, if I'm going too fast, which I know I am, just I want you to know that I'm showing you the things you can do and that you will be able to do by following through the hand the hand notes. So by clicking on this icon, you can see you can zoom in and I can generate my map. Oh, very nice. Um, then I can add, for example, a scale. For, um, and there, this scale is in kilometers, and it's done to this scale of this map, which is really nice. And I can add, for example, a title, and then I'll call it quits with my masterpiece here. So my first map. Uh, there's all kinds of options here that you can, you can look. The font's a bit small, so I'm going to increase it. Okay, my first map. Then you've generated, you've spent hours and hours on, on this viewer, generated the map you just, it, you just like. It's perfect. Now you want to export. You can export um, using this icon here, and you can select as a PNG if, if you want. So here's an example, my first map. Save. And it's going to export at 300 dpi. You can specify how many dots per inch you want and the width, so on and so forth. So it's very powerful. It's improved. This particular section has improved dramatically over the years. Um, also, the first few versions kept crashing and crashing, so I would have actually recommended you save the project before you even clicked uh, export. But now I think we're not having any problem. Yeah, my first map. And so it's exported it in my, uh, yeah, in this temp, as I told it to. And there it is, beautiful image. Um, that is an image file. You can also export as a PDF um, as well. So I'll just do this and then I'll stop and take questions. <laughs> uh, my first PDF image. And this should come up. Yeah, PDF here. And now you can see it's a PDF image of the map. Okay, I think I'll stop because otherwise I'll go on for hours and hours um, and, and we'll take questions if there are any at this point. Thank you so much. That was an excellent overview, and um, you managed to put a lot of information into the into the short time frame that we had. It's great. Um, I think folks will have everything they need in order to get started and start building their own first maps if they haven't done it before. Um, and uh, just a reminder to everyone, those handouts are available. If you haven't seen them yet, if you look under the control panel of GoTo, you'll, you'll find them under Handouts, and they're available for download there. We'll also be posting them to our website along with the recording of this presentation. Um, so question and answer period. So to ask a question, you can use your webinar control panel. Um, if it's minimized for you, just hit the orange arrow and that will enlarge it. So if you're using the audio of your computer, you can figuratively raise your hand, which is the yellow uh, hand icon with the green arrow. We can unmute you and you can ask your question directly, or you have the option of typing in your question and we'll read it aloud for you. So it looks like we've already got some questions. So the first question comes from Peter Crowley. He asks, will there be automatic messages regarding updated versions? Uh, I don't believe there are, but what I do from time to time, because it was so painful to update, I actually would just stick to one version and not update. But um, it's actually becoming easier and easier. And what I actually did just before this webinar to make sure I had the latest version was go to help, and then I just um, checked, yeah, checked QGIS version, and it then it prompted me to say there's a new one and you need to update. So it's not automated, but if you check regularly, um, 
that's no problem. And I would almost assume there's a new version every three or four months. If you go online, you can actually see when they're, when the versions roll out. It's very, very common. Um, six months and they're probably uh, time for an up update. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the next question comes from Susanna Bruno. She asks, what are the benefits of UTM versus lat long for recording locations? Okay, so yeah, that was a really quick overview. If you just have locations in the field, I think a lot of you are with uh, watershed groups and you've got a GPS unit, I would stick to lat long. It's a lot easier to record. It's people are familiar with it. You can, uh, and I didn't even go into Google Maps or Google Earth, but those are excellent tools. You can launch those, type your coordinates, and 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 everybody understands them. So when it's that the that type of data collection, absolutely um, lat long GPS. When you're doing analysis, so then you're going to be looking at distances, angles. Um, for example, in, in cluster detection, you need to know what the distances are between farms. Then you have to convert to a UTM. I'm saying UTM. There are lots of options. I just like being it simple. Everybody seems to, to be in agreement that UTM is the way to go. The problem is once you start converting your data sets to one projection, you need to keep them all in that projection. So before you start changing one or two data sets here, you almost need to make uh, a decision from the beginning. I'm going to do analysis. I'm going to convert all my data sets that are relevant for the analysis into UTM. That's kind of how I, I approach that, the issue. Thank you. Uh, so the next question comes from Connor Moody. He asks, can I import whole zip files or do I always have to unzip them? I've never tried uploading a zip file, so it's something that you can play around with. My guess is it won't work, but um, there's <laughs> prove me wrong, <laughs> so try it and if it works, it works. The other way um, as well, um, is database. If, if you are serious about having lots of different uh, data sets and, and a large team or group and you want to update live, if you will, then I would recommend going towards databases, but that will require its own course uh, altogether. Thank you. Uh, Peter Crowley gave a little comment. He said, fantastic presentation. I will be attempting to teach QGIS to my students. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, great. Yeah, glad to hear it. Because, but I mean, I, I'm glad that message came through because um, there's a lot of information to cover. But I think that really, what's nice is it's QGIS is getting better. It's easy to use, and there's a great online um, community with support. And and I think it's the way forward. So I'm glad other people are feeling the same way. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from John Stinson. He asks, can you give us the link, the URL, where these webinars are stored? I found them once but had problems finding them recently. Okay, I guess I can answer that question. So webinars are available on the website of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation um, as well as the Canadian Rivers Institute, although I think most of the webinars from this current year um, are just available on the Canadian, um, on the Atlantic Salmon uh, Foundation website. So our website address is simply www.salmonconservation.ca, and then you'll find a tab for our webinars. Oh, thank you very much for pulling it up. That's excellent. And you'll find them all there. Now, those are only the webinars from the current season. We do have a few from past seasons located on the Canadian Rivers Institute uh, YouTube page. We are looking into getting them all posted um, sometime, hopefully, um, in the coming months, but if there is a webinar that you know of from the past that you'd like to see and you don't find it on our website from, say, a past year, just send me a note uh, and I would be more than happy to, to get it to you. So my email address is darla, D-A-R-L-A, at salmonconservation.ca. The next question comes from Richard Olwa. He asks, how do you digitize coordinates in QGIS? Okay. Um, that there's actually lots of avenues that you can go down, and it depends what you mean by digitizing coordinates. If you mean uh, images, so maps, uh, for example, if you've got a nice old map from, from the 1800s that you've scanned, and it's in a PDF or a TIFF, then you can use the georeferencer, which uh, it's difficult to have a whole session on it, um, but uh, can I find it very quickly? Georeference, yeah, under raster, georeferencer. And then this comes up, and then you need to find an image. Um, oh, actually, 
you know what, I do have an image that happens to be quite practical. Um, so this is a farm sites and it's following one tide excursion from one site. Um, and so what you would do is if you have an image, then uh, it's hard to show again because it's not synced with the map in the background, but essentially what you do is you would tick on, yeah, you can add points in this image and match them with a real location in, um, in your main uh, display and that will give it on, on the image an X and Y coordinate. So you can georeference is, is what I'm trying to get at very clumsily. Um, so you can georeference an image. Otherwise, if you've got data such as an Excel spreadsheet where you've got X and Y coordinates, then using CSV file import I find is, is a very good way. Um, if you're looking to digitize vectors, so for example, roads, so on and so forth, you can edit them by hand, um, but that is dangerous uh, territory. So every time you've got uh, a polygon such as this one, you can toggle this little edit button and you can see all the little red dots and if you zoom all the way in, you can start manipulating where these coordinates are. You can generate new ones as well, um, but again, um, this is beyond the scope of, of this uh, webinar and also a little bit dangerous because you're going to be doing things by hand. So if I were you, the best approach is use a scanned image and then bring that into a raster and then there are tools where you can convert rasters to vectors um, depending on how clear the maps are. Excellent, thank you. That, I think, is the last of our questions. A huge thank you, Raphael. This was an excellent presentation, um, and I, I have a feeling that this is going to be one of our very popular downloads from our website. Um, so thank you very, very much. It was it was my pleasure, and I hope people managed to follow along. I was a bit fast, and I think I crammed a bit too much, but I think this is a nice taster, and with the um, handouts, people can do it on their own afterwards. So. Hopefully, uh, you guys will have benefited from, from, from the webinar. I, I know folks have, and the handouts are going to be a really useful tool. And like I mentioned earlier, they will be available on our website for download if you didn't get them now. Um, just to wind up our presentation, a little reminder that the next uh, webinar in the series is going to be on March 9th. Uh, Marie Clement of... Um, uh, Mun in Newfoundland will be speaking about the salmon population of lack of Lake Melville in Labrador. This presentation will be in French. Our next English presentation was to be on March 23rd on the topic of how to assess culverts for fish passage, an introduction with the folks from Adopt a Stream. This presentation is still going forward, but it's now been rescheduled to April 20th. Um, so registration and the listing of the webinars is all available on, on the website, um, as was previously pulled up. Um, a huge thank you to everyone to, for participating. Uh, a big thank you to Raphael, and I've just gotten a bunch of thank yous here from various folks um, saying how much they enjoyed the presentation and that it was absolutely excellent. Um, and so we hope uh, people will be able to join us again on a future webinar very soon. <laughs>